suspicion that those militants got together in the underground in Athens in September of 1941 to do what really seemed to be apparent, to write the first page of what might have been, indeed what should have been, a new scenario for the country of Greece. You see, only five months before, that country had been beset by an occupation, and there were 300,000 occupation troops that swarmed over the country and that broke her over the liberties of her submissive people. But the communists, nonetheless, began to resist very early. No matter that there was all of that regression, the Green Communist Party reformed very quickly in the underground and then launched the effort to form a broad resistance movement. For three months at least, the communists negotiated with the bourgeois parties to collaborate in that resistance front. They went to the Liberal Party and they went to the Populist Party. And it should not surprise us that those bourgeois chiefs turned them down cold, that they said that such an adventure was premature, that they said it was utopian, and they certainly implied that they would much prefer to collaborate with fascists than with communists anyway. But what really does surprise us is that the communists bothered at all to solicit and to seek out the heads of those bourgeois parties. We have talked about that class as a Roman bourgeoisie, which periodically and consistently in modern Greek history betrayed the Greek masses, which did not even program the capitalist development in that country, which hung on to the coattails of a foreign imperialism. Why, after all, should that Greek party even have extended its hand? An important question in terms of the strategy that Greek communism will follow in this entire adventure, because you see, you are dealing with a party in the Greek Communist Party, which, no matter how courageous its militants have been in resisting the oppression of the Metaxas regime, in going off to prison, in being tortured, no matter what you can credit those militants with, it is a party that has been notoriously impoverished on the plane of doctrine and theory. A party that has been notoriously submissive to the Moscow line, to the directives as set down by the common term. Go back, for example, right before the Metaxas period. Go back to the year 1934, instructed, and the Greek Communist Party holds a Congress. And at that Congress, it adopts what, what is a line so inappropriate for Greece, so inappropriate for any third world country, a line which one had thought had been torpedoed by Lenin in 1917, the line of the historic stages of development. Because the common term was then saying that in any third world country, in any country as underdeveloped as Greece, that the people cannot go immediately to socialism, that the next stage of their development must be the bourgeois democratic stage in which the working classes or the popular classes must ally with the bourgeoisie. And what they must do is to wipe out the remnants of feudalism, but for God's sake, there was no feudalism in Greece. And that is the point, that Greece, after all, had a country of small parcelized farmers and not big estates, that there wasn't anything that formally could be called feudalism. And that in the second place, the idea of working with a bourgeoisie that had persistently refused to make precisely that revolution of democracy and even that capitalist development was sheer folly. So that it doesn't surprise us that when it came to the question of how you put together a resistance movement, what kind of a resistance movement you form, that the communists were beholden to the Stalinist position, or the position of the Soviet leadership, which was that the resistance movement must be as broad-based as possible, include everyone, regardless of ideology or class, who is willing to fight against the uh, occupier and mute the idea of social revolution, stress always simply the national liberation of the country, play down anything that will frighten all the moderate elements, or anything that will unsettle the alliance that the Soviet Union has with the capitalist powers of the West. And consequently, they solicited the bourgeoisie, and the bourgeoisie turned them down. 
And so they went to the left. They went to three trade union federations, and they went to three small left-wing parties, and all agreed to be part of this National Liberation Front, and it was founded then, in September of 1941. And they together wrote the founding statute, a document which remained reasonably secret for quite a long period of time, in which the stress to be sure is upon national liberation, get the occupier out of Greece, but in which there is the implication at least that at the end of that arduous struggle, there will be the social liberation of the Greek people. Because the statutes call for the conversion of Eon, of the Liberation Front at the end of the war, into a provisional government. A provisional government that would then convoke a constituent assembly for what purposes? In order to give the people sovereign now a chance to express their preference for a form of government, which implies that the king will not be restored. Secondly, a constituent assembly to enable the people to gain enough power so that they can resist reactionary attacks upon their sovereignty, which implies that there will be a radical reapportionment of social and economic power. And a constituent assembly, finally, in order to guarantee the total independence of Greece, which implies a snapping of the colonial bond that the imperialistic position of Britain or any other Western power will not be permitted. And so by all logic and by all rights, the launching of that national liberation movement should have been the first step on the road to a Greek revolution. But you see, the history of Greece in the 1940s really warns us very sternly against oversimplifying the revolutionary project. Because the road from resistance to revolution in Greece would be arduous, would be treacherously mined, and the Greek masses, no matter how magnificently they fought in the resistance of the civil war, would never quite traverse it. Because there were high obstacles on that road. Obstacles both national and international, and they barred the route to revolution. Remember in the first place that Ea, the National Liberation Front, may have dominated the resistance movement, but it did not monopolize it. That there were other interests, British imperialism, before reactionary bourgeoisie, and certainly monarchists, who were hangers on to the king's entourage, who began to support a competitive resistance movement, one that should be a tax ball for a conservative restoration in Greece. And so it was that at the same time that EA was founded, so was EDES, E-D-E-S, which calls itself the Greek National Democratic Front, and that Edith is formed presumably under a Republican and a Democratic star. In other words, it is to be a resistance movement, not reactionary, but somewhat to the left. It goes back to the idea of General Plastiras. And General Plastiras had been an old Republican war horse in on all the anti-monarchical plots in the 1920s and 30s, and now sitting in exile in Paris, and wanting some kind of a resistance movement that should be Republican, but also bourgeois, and consequently thinking it will have to be somewhat social. It will have to be perhaps social democratic. And consequently, he sends an emissary all into Athens at the end of August of 1941, an emissary to seek out liberal support for such a resistance movement. And the emissary gets no such support. The only favorable attention he gets comes from an inveterate opportunist, a man who had already been accused of being a double agent, both for the British and the Germans at the same time, an army officer named Colonel Napoleon Zervas. And Zervas, who didn't give a city, after all, about anything in the program of Edens, 
about its democratic ideals, about its social democratic perspectives. Zerbov was interested in a power base, was interested in some kind of base that should give him a springboard in this resistance of movement. And so he helped to found Edis in September of 1940, uh, in September of 1941, and very quickly became the key figure in it. Because we see Zerbos, for all of his opportunity, for all that he is the model of an unscrupulous character, that Zerbos was a rather brilliant guerrilla leader. And consequently, he left Athens in uh, July of 1942 and went up to his native terrain of Epirus, a near the Albanian border, a very mountainous province of Greece, and there launched a partisan movement which had a certain success in that area. And since that was the only real base for the strength of Edis, you really must associate it with him. And from the beginning, that organization recruited ex-army officers, or recruited hands on of British imperialism, who were all more or less at least covertly a But by 1943, Edis is a reactionary organization. Uh, the people who have come into it are those who are scared now of Eon and consequently looking for some war against it. And so you get all of these repulsive collaborators of uh, that puppet regime uh, that was established by the Nazis and Catholics who begin to flood into uh, this so-called uh, resistance movement. And so it commended itself uh, to the British. And so the British subsidized it. And so the British gave it whatever sparse military help their military mission in Greece distributed to the resistance of the movement. But let's not overestimate it, because it has never had really an implanted that was significant. It never had a kind of infrastructure that really depended upon or could call upon the mass. It was restricted to Epirus and a few cities, and consequently is no real competition for Eon. Because Eon grows into something epochal. Eon grows into something fantastic. You're talking about a movement that did not get British help, that really had to live close to, next to, and through the people, that went to the people after all and enrolled them in a resistance movement and began to propagandize them, began to catalyze their energy and their revolt. That by the end of 1943, Edos is in, uh, uh, the Eon is implanted in every village and every city of Greece. That Eon by that time has controlled villages where it has installed a democratic elected government. That it has established schools. That it has even begun to attack the patriarchal family and won the support of the women and of the young. And that by 1945, when the whole civil war had not yet begun, but the resistance was over, by the end of the war, he had controlled 80% of the country. A state within a state, but almost the whole state, and providing a form of democracy that had not heretofore come to modern Greece. And so that isn't the obstacle, really. It is not endless. And if that is an obstacle easily scaled, then the obstacle of strategy is higher and more formidable. Because we're talking about a conflict of strategy, a cleavage in the ranks of Eon, or more precisely of the Greek Communist Party, between the orthodox Soviet position, the kind of Soviet orthodoxy of the Central Committee of the Greek Communist Party, and the revolutionary orthodoxy of those guerrilla commanders, those capitalists who go out into the Marquis. Now let me not in any way underestimate what those militants in the Greek Central Committee went through in order to get there. You take the guy like George Yankos, who is the general secretary of the party 
when it is reformed in 1941 and the law. And that's not going to be already over 50. And that spends his entire life as a military, as a very poor boy, impoverished in a tobacco factory, joining the Tobacco Workers Union, making very dangerous and jeopardizing strikes, and then joining the Communist Party as soon as it is founded, suffering. Exile, suffering torture under the Axis. Don't underestimate that. But Santos is in the party all the time. He's an old party guy and used to the flip flops of the line. And what else is there to hold on to if you're examining all the times than the party line? And consequently, he surrounds himself, he's surrounded in the Central Committee by very orthodox sectarian types. Many of them have been through the party school in Moscow. And so they followed the where that the resistance movement had to be more based, had to be more national liberation, and not get too radical. Which meant that the tactics, in order to guarantee that, were urban and military. The resistance movement, according to the free communist leadership, was to be urban and military. In other words, that primary activity was to be the military activity of sabotaging the German occupation, of undermining it, of causing it finally a collapse. And that very operation was to go on in and from the city. That in the city, where the party can count on the loyalty of the working classes, where it could reach the petty bourgeoisie. In those cities, it could overseer, it could control, it could move that resistance movement to its military target. It could pull out strikes in the city and demonstrations, and it could cut communication lines, and it could cut off supply lines. And in the final analysis, it was to come from the city a great insurrection, which insurrection in the final days was to throw out of the German occupier. And let's face it, that the party did well in the city, that Eon did well, which was the party's real instrument. When you stop to think that only seven months after that Eon had been founded, that there really is in the cities of Greece, the major cities especially, a terrific scheme by the resistance movement, that they have organized in every quarter of these cities, and that the they please look what they do. There is a curfew in the city of Athens, and they are able simply to move out at night after the curfew with Opla, with security guard who are armed, and put up their posters, put up their money, good red ink, that say down with the tyranny, that say down with the terror, down with the puppet government, that say after all the things that are important to rally a public attack. And so on, by the 11th of April of 1942, only seven months after, roughly, the uh, Eon had been founded, what they were able to do in the cities was a strike of national proportion. Because on the 11th of April, a strike a was pulled off by 50,000 state employees, interested state employees, which shows you how fragile the whole of the public government was. Or which shows you how very alienated that puppet that public government was even from the people of the workforce. And so in the city of Athens, in Patra, in Parade, in Salonita, a strike took place that lasted from the 11th to the 21st of April and that got these state functionaries of the wage increases they had in Athens. By the time we get to the of 1942, this was the already freely grown by the resistance movement. And on the 20th and the 21st of December, a tens of thousands of tracks are passed out in the city of Athens, a calling for a tremendous demonstration of against economic misery, against unemployment, against the political terror. We have taken about more than 20,000 workers away back on the 22nd of December. A tremendous strike, and then carried their son under the noses of the Italian party, and under the noses of the Nazi 
of the Capitol, and they heard their placards that said not only a down with the puppet government, but in a down behind that left, and Stalin bent over backwards.
of not being who they capture, that they move all day in that city in a world that caused the police and the troops to flee. He doesn't say Hitler could not before full scale war. It's a reform. It's not after Stalin. And I feel like the seventh of bar came the order that the labor construction was an all. The Athenians and the Greeks working on did not go all to that super But for all of that room and for all of that success, the point is that an urban resistance, and certainly the Greek urban resistance, has its limitations. It has military and it has political limitations. Military, quite obviously, because you concentrate the resistance in a city. And suppose the enemy, after all, is able to encircle that city. Suppose it is able to take that city. The Nazis didn't want to bother. But suppose the British landed an army at the time of liberation, and they found the resistance to have been so concentrated in the city, they could take it all. You see, that's the lesson the Algerians learned in 1957, 14 years later, they did not. Uh, because they, too, thought that the urban resistance would drive the French out. And we know that General Shaw organized the reduction of the city. And in the Battle of Algiers, it crushed that urban resistance. And in the Algerian resistance movement, the nationalist movement, had to take off to the hill, had to take off to the Orange Mountains, into the so-called Winnie Islands, uh, which were those revolutionary bases uh, in the country. And consequently, there is that a constant vulnerability. But you see, even politically, that urban resistance doesn't really change social relationships. When it is a series of program acts, and you attack the Nazi position in one way or another, but it doesn't mean that you take effective power in any way, or political power, or take a factory. It doesn't change the social and political relationships of the society. And consequently, it has a mobilizing, but not necessarily a revolution but you see, that's exactly what the Greek Communist Party leadership wanted. Uh, they wanted, after all, a movement that they could uh, control, a movement that they could foresee, a work that would not get out of hand. So the terrific suspicion of the armed resistance movement in the countryside, of that kind of movement which is cut off uh, from the surveillance of the sector, uh, just like the French Communists during the resistance movement, who never knew what the Maquis were doing, in the South, Makita, who hated people like Tiong because they were fighting out of the bush. You see what happens when you put dogs in the hands of people and when you don't feed them orders all the time and when they are involved in a struggle, then there's no predictability. They may decide that it is time for a revolution that you can fall over a state. And so the party leadership was always suspicious of that, but there was defection from their ranks. Because that was not the view of those guerrilla chiefs, those Kamehameha. The ones who thought that the resistance movement ought to be not urban and military, but that it ought to be rural and political. Rural for good reason. For the reason that Hong Se Do and Ho Chi Minh a thought that a great liberation movement has to be rural. That if you are in a country mainly with peasants, that's where the people are. And that you have, after all, to arm and to engage that peasantry if you are to drive out any kind of enemy, any kind of overlord. And furthermore, from a military point of view, how do you really succeed? You succeed, after all, by surrounding the cities with the armed villages. But think of the political consequences of that. That that kind of a rural resistance movement means the transformation of that peasantry. It means, after all, that you liberate zones, and that in those zones there's another kind of political practice, another kind of a way of life. You see those guerrillas of Kamehameha, those people who went out into the mountains, 
and another stratagem for grief development. Your idea was not an alliance between the working class and the progressive bourgeoisie, but between the working class and the insurgent and the free. Now that resistance in the mountains started spontaneously, and so the Communist Party had to respond to it. That is, you have the mountains after all that social banditry, that kind of tradition of the cadet. You have after all that tradition of the undocked, of partisans who go out to struggle against the Turkish overlords, to struggle against the unscrupulous landlords or what. And consequently, from the start of the resistance, it happened sporadically. <laughs> and for the Communist Party, it was important to guide it, to direct it. And so over the winter of 1941 and 2, the party's leadership and the leadership of IA decided to seize the villages. In other words, to send IA representatives to village after village, a district after district, and to leave their faithful in each of these villages until such time as there was an IA network in the mountains. And by the 20th of April of 1942, it was announced in the Eon underground newspaper called Free Greece that the arms of partisan battle in the mountains were about to be formed. Now the leadership did this hesitantly, always suspiciously, but it did it. And a month after that announcement, by June of 1942, in the mountains of, Ru uh, of uh, Rumeli, in central Greece, where there was, after all, such a very strong incline of that old tradition of the cleft against the Turkish occupation. In Rumeli, in June of 1942, in village after village, that arm resisted the gap. And there was formed what became the great army of the National Liberation for Elon. And they are emerged the greatest of the leaders of the armed resistance, that class of a bourgeois family whose parents were better babies, who himself had a university degree, Hanakos Glass, who dropped that name and identifies with the people and goes to the mountains and is known as Aris Belotiak. And Aris, after all, is at the heart of this story. To say of him that he was what Goodhouse called him, who was the British military agent with the British military mission in Greece, and what Chris Woodhouse called him in Capital of Discord, his memoir, the military genius of Elon, is not to exaggerate. That he was a great guerrilla leader, one of the greatest in the 20th century, is not to exaggerate. That he had an incredible capacity uh, to be able to engage the peasantry, to catalyze their energy and their revolt, is indisputable. That I also had a commitment to revolutionary communism that was much less negotiable than that of the Central Committee of the Greek Communist Party is also true. That he was the only one of the top leaders who refused to sign in February of 1945 the Barkiza Accord, which after all forced Ion and Elas to give up his arm. And for that, he would be expelled from the party and his death program. And so he, Thomas, with his undying with his partisan, went from village to village. And they made off in the same speed. And they said to the villagers who they gathered in the central square that we are raising the flag of revolt. And that this small band that you see here is only the nucleus of what will soon be an army of thousands. And they urged the peasantry to join them, and the peasantry was amazed and astonished. Because they stayed a bit, you see. And there is a magnificent description of what happened. They get these peasants in the square. They come in, and you know, Honest wasn't fortunate. I mean, there was this horrendous beard, and there was this glint in the eye. 
And he did, in a sense, instill charismatically a kind of admiration and fear at the same time. That was all in the Lucian. And so he would gather these peasants in the square, and after he would say, this is what we're into, he would then turn to their politics. And there is a description of that in the memoirs of one of his followers, Dimitrio de Caboris. And Dimitrio de Caboris writes, after we asked the villagers to organize for the struggle, we would ask them if they were satisfied with their mayor. Now, Eon had filled us in beforehand on the problems in local affairs for each village. And the people were amazed and overjoyed that we knew what their grievances were about. Now, if the villagers wanted a new mayor, we proceeded to have an election on the spot. We took from them the names of candidates. Then a partisan read the list, and they voted by hand. And the one with the most votes became mayor. Four and six, uh, four or six others were elected municipal councillors, each one with a special responsibility for the struggle. Food supply, security, popular justice against class enemies, education. As a result, we inflated the organization of EOM. It had already existed in every village, but it was secret and limited. After our passage there, it came out in the open and recruited about the whole population. In every village, we left key contact persons, one to train the young for combat, another to look after the rights of women, still another to make sure that self-government wasn't undermined. How far all of that went is really, in a sense, given in an Akrosri by Woodhouse. Colonel Woodhouse, after all, was no great admirer of a Greek revolution, but he really was amazed by what he saw out in the Greek hills in those years that he was with the British military mission. And in his memoirs, Apple of Discord, he talks about the remaking of the countryside. Having gained control of almost all territory, except those main groups used by the Germans, Eon Enos gave the country things it never had before. Communication in the mountains, schools, courts, and local self-government, theaters, small factories, popularly elected assemblies functioning for the first time. I must admit that in those three mountains, I saw a popular democracy function for the first time. And so it was, after all, that this became an implantment. The final analysis for the Central Committee, it was always a problem. They never knew what the hell those guys were doing. And consequently, they began to hear rumors that Aris was going too far, that he was brutalizing the class enemy. And that when they found out through all these partisans, or when they found collaborators, or when they found exploiters of the peasants, or when they found monarchists who were in the camp of Zarabas, they were bombing the wall, and they were threatening the liberals, and they were threatening them of the whole doubt of this resistance front. And consequently, they decided that they had to discipline armies. He was getting out of hand, and he was convoked unto a secret meeting of the Central Committee of the Greek Communist Party in March of 1943. And it's that famous picture of armies of going into Athens, presumably in disguise, in a priest's robe, he was. And he moved in a priest's robe and he refused to shave his beard, which was his hallmark. And consequently, that face with that beard known everywhere by now, and consequently just putting on the priest's robes to joke around. And so he got to that meeting of the Greek Communist Central Committee, and they read out his roster of charges against him. That, for example, he was bombing off those who were considered to be collaborators instead of just imprisoning them and so forth, and he listened to all this music. Then they got on to the question of Zaragoz, and they said, and with him, uh, you are making more, and you are not trying to collaborate, and he answered at that point, and he said, you see, Zaragoz is a careerist, and there's only one way. Uh, either you eliminate him, or you turn your movement over to him. And obviously, the Lutheans had no intention of turning the movement over uh, to Zaragoz. At the end, he recanted nothing. And he turned to the Central Committee and he said, you know what you ought to do. You ought to go to the mountains 
that's where the people are, that's where the movement is, that's where the future is. It's then that he cited that phrase of that time, the no das, I'm called the no das, audacity, always audacity, go to the mountains and make a revolution. Well, you see, within months, that Central Committee did go to the mountains. It had to because it was frightened that the British were going to invade Greece and consequently that their movement might be surrounded and might be crushed by the British and they did take to the mountains. Always there was suspicion and hostility uh, between the real Capitanios and those communists who were oriented toward uh, the Moscow line, but even that is not an insuperable obstacle. Where then is the barrier? that can't be spared. It is an imperialism. And it is in the British presence in Greece, which was a formidable presence. Because you see, the, the British interest in Greece during the war was not only to drive out the Nazi occupation, but to restore and preserve its colonial dominion over Greek affairs. You see, in a world that is responsive to the imperative of imperialism, no country goes revolutionary unnoticed by the predators on the outside. Not even a geographic step like Greece, in which British investors for all to all had turned a very fast path, and from which British strategists for a very long time had guarded their expansionist lifeline, those sacrosanct approaches to the eastern Mediterranean and to Suez. And so it was that the British were held bent on going back to Greece and remaining there as the primary influence. And in order to do that, they had a two-pronged strategy. One was, after all, to protect the king and the government in exile in Cairo. To protect them and to restore them. That that king, George II, yes, the one who had brought on the Coxes on the 4th of August of 1936, that he would go out after the liberation. And with him, that government in exile that had been taken off the mainland in May of 41, and that was a remnant of the Metoxas regime, and that that would go back to us. Now, to show you how determined the British were not to give way for Greek revolution, you have to understand what it means to say that they're going to restore the king and that government in exile. That king has less popularity than Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> that king, after all, was despised by the Greek people who had suffered under the Nazis. And even the bourgeois politicians, even the ones who ordinarily would have supported him, felt until 1943, when the communist menace became too great for them, until 1943 that the abdication of George II was a very small price to pay for muting a revolutionary movement. The king had no support. As far as that government in exile is concerned, it is headed by one Emmanuel Tuderos. Tuderos, a non-entity who had sat as a director of the Bank of Greece, which was like a British front office. And so Tuderos, who became the Prime Minister on the 21st of April of 1941, just a week before the Nazis occupied the city, and remained there until the British removed him on the 3rd of April of 1944, this Tuderos was a British puppet. But he kept in his ministry all those terrible people out of the Metoxas regime. Mayadakis, who was that oppressive, repressive minister of the interior. The bureaucracy was the same fascist bureaucracy. And why? Because they were loyal to the king and loyal to the British. And that could be brought back. But you see, the British ploy is a marvelous one. Because if they can get the king and that government in exile back, they have a sure conflict of their influence. Those agencies can possibly survive without them, their in the British public. 
And certainly in the middle of 1943, when that strategy was perfectly clear, the British had the support of the Americans. The Americans didn't yet know that Greece was theirs. And consequently, in the middle of 1943, when the British Foreign Office wired and cabled to the State Department and said that the king and the government in exile must be restored after the Germans are removed from Greece, otherwise there will be anarchy, I mean, it's a communist party, otherwise there will be anarchy and chaos, and the American State Department was in accord. The other part of that strategy was to contain the resistance movement, because that is a reality. But a bit of a dilemma, to contain the radical resistance movement, but to find some kind of resistance movement that actually can help in the war effort. That was important. And the agency that was to handle that was a part of British intelligence called the SEO, or the SOE. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the office of, the office of, the SOE, the SOE, the strategic, uh, strategic operations executive, uh, SOE, which is simply uh, another name for the British intelligence dealing with the resistance movement. What they do is to set up in Cairo a center for the Middle East which concerns itself with Greece likewise. And in the agents of the SOE, there is a certain kind of conflict. There's a conflict between those who are what they call the military agents and those who are the political agents. Those who look at their task in a country like Greece or a country like Yugoslavia as supporting any resistance movement that can help the military defeat of the Nazis. In other words, help the British war effort. And then there are politicals who say, well, no, you can't do that if you're going to buttress a resistance movement that ultimately will have British position from that country. What happens is that the first agent of SOE land in Greece on the 1st of October of 1942. And they're led by these two guys, Brigadier General Edward Myers and Colonel Chris Woodhouse. And both of them reasonably perceptive and sensitive people. Woodhouse is especially a very young man, only 23, but they really did know Greece and knew the Greek language. And what they saw very quickly was that the idea of isolating Iam and Elon, of the idea of not dealing with the left-wing resistance movement, was very futile. That what the British would do would cut themselves off from any kind of infrastructural support inside the country. The idea of bringing back the king struck them as being impossible, that they found no support for the king. You see, they saw things on the sea. They recognized the reality out in those mountains that the resistance movement was to the left and you really had to cope with that. But nonetheless, at the beginning of 1943, the SOE in Cairo sends the following message to Woodhouse. We take note of the military importance of the resistance movement in Greece. We realize that you can't refuse contact with any group just for political reasons. But, except in cases of dire military necessity, you should always collaborate most closely with those groups which are ready to support the king and the government in exile. And you should explain to the anti-monarchist groups that the king and government enjoy the full support of Her Majesty's government. <laughs> and Woodhouse wrote an article in 1957 in which he's talking about his resistance experiences and referring to that particular message in which he says, given the circumstances of 1943, it was as though what were to ask of the English ambassador in Moscow that the important stop whenever they met of how devoted the British government was to the Romanos. <laughs> but he was the same. And that was the unrealist that you see at the British Foreign Office and those people in the SOE in Cairo who thought that they simply could not deal in any way, shape, or form with this resistance movement. What they tried to do, Myers and Woodhouse, was to work out some kind of a compromise. In other words, to get the factions of the resistance movement together, Elas and Elas, and also to get some kind of an agreement from the government in exile given to the resistance movement that they wouldn't impose the king until there had been a plebiscite. 
until you get that magnificent episode that really, in a sense, tells so much of how this story is going to go. Colonel, uh, General Myers, with a tremendous effort, arranged a conference in Cairo in August of 1943 with representatives of Elam, Iam, with representatives of Edes, with representatives then of the government in exile, and also with the king. Get them all together. See what kind of a compromise you can work out. Well, this place, Iam guys got to Cairo in August of 43, and they laid their cards on the table. They said, we're telling the government in exile, first of all, we don't like you. We're telling you, secondly, that you better issue a proclamation right away or you're finished, or that you're not going to impose the king on Greece. That 90% of the Greek people don't want him, and consequently there's got to be a plebiscite on whether the king returns or not before he ever sets foot on that terrain. At that point, Edis is represented by a young militant who is not reactionary and who accepts that position. And suddenly the resistance movement is saying that it really doesn't want the king back. Then Colonel, uh, the British ambassador uh, to the Greek government in exile, a character named Sir Reginald Leeper, Leeper arranges a luncheon uh, between the resistance representatives and the king. <laughs> Only the British would do that. <laughs> but only an exiled Greek king would do what George II did. He came an hour late in tennis shorts. <laughs> Not a good interview. <laughs> and consequently, the entire conference broke up with a message of the 17th of August of 1943 sent by the representatives of the resistance movement to the government in exile demanding that at once they announce that the king will not be restored without some kind of show of public will in Greece. But between their answer and the intervention of the British only two days passed, because if that government of exile might have caved in and said, all right, we'll dispose of the king, after all, we're at stake also. What happened was that the king on the 19th of August telegraphed both Churchill and Roosevelt and stirred them up. And what George II said was the following. What is being proposed will have repercussions outside Greece in the fall. That's the thing. That what will happen in Greece with the resistance movement coming into power will have a domino effect. I think that I should return to Greece with my army, even if, at, even if at some time in the future I should have to go back into exile again, to work with you, our allies, in the interests of the nation. Well, that was all Churchill needed, and consequently he intervened. He said that there would be no bargaining about the return of the king whatsoever, no bargaining about the government in exile. Myers was finished as far as Greece was concerned. He was sent back to London in disgrace, and consequently all contact between the British agents and Fiat Vidas stopped. From the collapse of that Cairo conference, the whole outline of the Greek story becomes clear. Because then it is clear that the British will try to impose their solution by force. They will have no other alternative. And they begin to think about that all through the rest of 1943. And that is especially true after the withdrawal of Italy from the war in September 43. Because when Italy withdraws from the war, then the Italian occupation force in Greece simply drops its weapons, the Greek partisans pick up all kinds of weaponry, the British have this view that when the Germans finally withdraw, there may be an army of 50 or 60 or 70,000 armed partisans who are communist control who will occupy the back. That becomes the problem. For the British, it is a real problem of imperialistic position. And they think that what they really need is an army of 50,000 to occupy Greece as soon as the Germans evacuated. But suppose the war isn't over and they can't spare an army of 50,000. What they do is to get a crack force of 10,000 in Italy, which they train in the most modern firepower, and they are to be paratrooped and landed immediately in Athens if the Germans leave. In other words, to be able to encircle, surround, repress 
have resisted movement which had become so natural. <laughs> and Eon and Eos took the initiative. On the 10th of March of 1944, they announced the formation of a provisional government for Greece. The background for that was the collapse of the so-called Plaka Conference, so in Plaka, a small town in Paris, on the 29th of February, 1944. Because that was the last time that there was some effort to try to bring a compromise between Eon and Edith under British auspices. The British were a little bit frightened because with the decision taken at the Conference of Tehran that there would be a second front in France, which meant that Churchill's dream of a big Balkan invasion wasn't going to take place. It meant that the Germans would occupy Greece for a period longer, and they wanted as an effective resistance as they could against the Germans in order to harass them once the second front was founded. So they called this conference, but Eon and Elos put down their terms. They wouldn't collaborate with Edith unless it was a genuine government of collaboration. In other words, unless they had a really fair and good part of it, and that the British would not consent to, it broke down and they established on the 10th of March their own provisional government. A provisional government with the goal, after all, of establishing what it was called a true and extended democracy in Greece upon the liberation of the country from the occupier. And to call a constituent assembly to establish the institutions of a new society. And that catalyzed a revolt in the Greek army. It is at that point that you get that revolt of Azo, ASO, that takes place in the first days of April of 1944. And you see what had happened to that Greek army that was sitting there in Egypt that it had been swollen by thousands of Greek soldiers who escaped the mainland. They had lived under that Nazi occupation and they were anti-fascist. And they were anti-government in exile, anti-monarchical. They wanted a new Greece. And consequently, they founded this organization, Azo. And when that provisional government was established by Eon, on the 10th of March of 1944, they were inspired. So they went at the end of March to Sudorius, to the Prime Minister of this government in exile, and they said, what we want is a genuine national coalition government in which Eon, in which the real resistance movement is represented, and those who went to see that, uh, that puppet Prime Minister were arrested and put into prison. And that catalyzed a revolt. From the 3rd to the 8th of April, a veritable revolt of the Greeks. That in that part, what they did was simply to establish barricades around their, their barracks, to establish barricades around ships, and consequently to guard them, to man them, or to protect them against any kind of British forces that might come on. It was what Sir Reginald Lieber, in a kind of a state of frenzy, called the Veritable Revolution. And he wired Churchill for construction. Churchill wired back the following. This is the Greek story. Churchill, on the 8th of April of 1944, in response to the revolt of Greek soldiers, who after all wanted a democratic Greece and something refurbished, wrote the following. Our relations are definitely established with the lawfully constituted Greek government headed by the king, who is the ally of Great Britain and cannot be discarded to soon a surge of appetite among emigre non-entities. Neither can Greece find constitutional expression in bands of guerrillas masquerading as the saviors of their country. I have been planning and I intend to devote myself to the task of placing Greece back in the ranks of civilized countries. And with those instructions from Churchill, the British troops moved in in force and crushed that army revolt, ultimately sent its militants to concentration camps. By the spring of 1944, then, the British had the design, it was forcefully, to impose a semi-colonial status which had been the historic burden of Greece back on her back again.
whether you breathe resistance movement or anything else. To resist that remains to be seen. But in the prison, for example, to cope with it, that after all, the design of a semi-colonial breeze was just as appealing across the ocean. <laughs> so you have this great resistance movement, and you have this obstacle, and you have these three people standing in front of that obstacle. And for people at the wall who presumably come to the Olympics, <laughs> too bad. Thank <laughs> you.